today's presentation, Agile Program Management, Scaling Agile Projects, um, we'll be talking about how Agile project management has driven successful results through thousands of projects across the globe through various frameworks like Scrum and Extreme Programming. The challenge remains in the coordination across larger organizations, aligning projects, products, and teams to deliver complex interdependent programs successfully. This, pres this presentation shares Agile program management best practices to guide project and program managers in larger organizations working across these boundaries to deliver complex programs. Our presenter today is Pete Behrens. He is an Agile leadership coach and the president of Trail Ridge Consulting. Uh, they are an Agile organization and leadership consulting firm specializing in large-scale Agile ass assessment, adoption, and implementation. Pete is a certified Scrum trainer and certified Scrum coach for the Scrum Alliance with over 18 years of experience in software and seven years guiding organizational-wide Scrum transformations. Pete is also active in the Agile Alliance, Agile Project Leadership Network, and the Scrum Alliance, where he helped guide the establishment of certified Scrum coaching. You can learn more about Pete and Trail Ridge Consulting at their website at trailridgeconsulting.com. And with that, I'll turn it over to Pete. Thank you. I uh, appreciate uh, the introduction and um, uh, welcome from sunny San Francisco today. Um, got stuck last night in the airport, so I'm uh, doing this from uh, my hotel room, but uh, appreciate your, uh, your time with me today. Um, uh, as mentioned, I've been uh, doing some, some training and coaching uh, in, in the Agile space for, for a number of years, and uh, what we'll be talking about today essentially is the manifestation of, of working with a number of organizations um, throughout that, and we'll talk about uh, a few of those uh, today. Um, so to, uh, to get started, uh, just a little bit of kind of intro on kind of what we're going to be talking about, focusing on today. Program management in general is the process of managing several um, related projects, or, or ultimately we can think about it as, as being um, managing a portfolio of products. And so uh, we can think of this in, in a number of different ways. Uh, but there's multiple dimensions, obviously, to program management, thinking about both the people involved, the organizations, the process that's involved in, in actually developing uh, those products or applications, uh, and obviously the products and, and applications themselves. And not to trivialize uh, this, but, but certainly there's, there's a lot of other elements that we'll be diving into, risks, dependencies, uh, government, finance, et cetera. Um, what we're going to be looking at, though, um, is a little bit more focused in the organizational uh, metric, and I'll, I'll go into that in just a minute. I'll be leaving some of the, the governance and finance areas to Sanjeev Augustine, who's going to be doing a talk in another month um, on some additional program management uh, uh, practice, best practices, uh, focusing on some of those some of those other areas. Uh, as just a summary, executive summary about what we'll be talking about today. Uh, effective agile program management has less to do with process than it does the organization. And I, I state that in such a way that wanting to highlight the fact that what I'm saying is organization over process. And this might seem very trivial, but it's also very relevant to the fact of where does Agile come from? And that comes from primarily the Agile Manifesto, which one of the statements in the Agile Manifesto says individuals and interactions over process and tools. But when we think about individuals and interactions, that's really the people and how people are organized and how people communicate. That is the key. And when we translate that into larger organizations, what we're saying is actually the organization as, a, as an entity is more important to the success of projects and programs than the exact process and tools that we're using. And so it's not saying we don't value the process and tools. We're just valuing the organizational element more. And this talk is going to be in line with that, focusing a little bit more on the organizational aspects of program management. And so to effectively scale agility to the organization or to large complex programs, the key is in the organization itself. So how does that play out? Essentially, when organizations are small, things are fairly simple. Uh, we have focus. Uh, we, can, we can clearly understand our our goals, there might only be one project or one product we're focused on. Uh, maybe we've got a couple of them. Um, communication is quite simple. We've got a focused team. Uh, in a startup environment, possibly, you, you've got uh, people that can communicate very effectively because we're all working on the same, uh, the same goal. And transparency is very relevant because everybody is seeing the same things. 
Um, there's, there's not a whole lot to get in the way. And so these things are coming for free. The focus, communication, and transparency are, are native to, uh, to the organization. And so as we grow an organization, can't we just grow this transparency, this focus, and communication, and put program management or a program manager in place to kind of coordinate that? Well, it's a bit idealistic, and it doesn't typically work. Why, why is that? Well, for a number of things, uh, I think we see. Number one, focus becomes challenged. In most organizations, a team is made up of a number of individuals that report into different parts of the organizations. And so you know, developers may report into a functional manager that's, that's leading a team of developers. Uh, likewise, testers would report into the potentially a quality assurance department. And what we're seeing is the fact that these members of these teams often have uh, uh, multiple focus elements, multiple directions that they'll be uh, providing for. And so focus in larger organizations is, is uh, a challenge. The second thing is communication begins to break down. Uh, what we're seeing on the right-hand side of this slide is uh, a, a common chart that shows, based on the number of people in an organization or a team, what are the potential communication paths? Uh, that can that that uh, are available uh, to them, and as an organization or team grows, the number of communication paths actually grows exponentially. And so, looking at you know, once you get past about 10 people, which is about 45 communication paths, that growth begins to um, shoot. And what you see on the left-hand side here is essentially a picture of an assessed organization's communication. And we do this through techniques uh, for uh, uh, essentially gathering how an organization develops software. And you're seeing roles portrayed in this, this left-hand chart. Uh, each role is represented by a, a box. Uh, each box will be connected to other box through communication lines. These communication lines uh, are either very thin, representing a weak communication, or very thick and red, representing a hot or a, a very strong communication path. And by analyzing an organization and its communication, we can understand the intricacies of how work gets done. Roles that tend to be more involved in communication come to the center and become brighter red. Roles that are a little bit less central to communication fall to the outside and become paler or uh, white. And so you not only see the, the communication paths and, and the amount of communication going on, but you also see the intensity ratios and who's the bottlenecks from a communication standpoint in an organization. And I want to highlight this because as we go through this discussion, we'll be talking a little bit more about how organizational communication impacts your ability to manage uh, your programs uh, with respect to um, multi, you know, coordinating multiple teams. And so this is an example of a service industry um, uh, application team. They develop a number of uh, applications for uh, essentially providing software as a service, um, um, uh, doing service matching for, uh, for clients. And finally, the, the last item, transparency uh, in organizations, in large organizations, becomes opaque. It, it's, it's something that with the, the amount of information, the numbers of status reports, the, um, uh, it, it becomes challenged to understand exactly what's going on. Uh, we might have dashboards. We may have some tools available to us. But in most organizations, what we're seeing is almost too much information. And that, that amount of information is actually hiding the real uh, underlying issues that are going on in the organization. And so these, these Three items, the lack of focus, uh, the lost communication that, that comes with, with the, the numbers in, of growing people in the organization, and the, the opaqueness or, or the little of transparency that we have then translates into program management issues, uh, dealing of predictability. How are we going to get larger projects out on time? Uh, the dependencies, you know, how are we managing some of these dependencies because we have so many Coordinating, uh, coordinating teams and people working together, how do we actually get those unknown risks, right? If, if we know about the risk, there's something we can manage. But the biggest issue is the risk we don't know about. 
And the problem is with the communication that's lost, with the transparency is not available, there's many risks that go unsurfaced. And that's the biggest, that's one of the biggest issues, which then obviously leads to some low quality solutions, which is what we're trying to avoid. So this is a serious problem in program management. And now we could certainly put in processes and procedures in place to do better program management. But what this talk is about is what are the practices we can put in place that actually change the structure of the organization in such a way that it makes program management easier. So we're not dependent so much on the program manager. We're putting in place a structure of the organization that allows program management to uh, come to the surface in a way. Let me take a, a bit of a sidestep here and understand what's at play. Um, uh, Mel Conway uh, put together a, uh, a paper back in 1968. Okay, so I'm dating, dating myself here with, with this research. Uh, but it's amazingly prevalent in, in uh, solutions today and in, in organizations today. And what it's essentially saying uh, in his paper, and it's a, an observation of organizations, is that an organization uh, is it's the organizational structure that an organization has will develop an architecture that's essentially a copy of the organization. And just to give you a very simple example, they did some studies in the 60s developing compilers, and that was pretty hot back then. Uh, they, they had a five-person team and a three-person team, uh, and they both built compilers. Well, the five-person team developed a five-process compiler, and the th three-person team developed a three-process compiler. And it's like, okay, why is this happening? And they started to extrapolate this, and they realized that when we start to distribute work, and we start to set up sub-functions of, of organizations and teams, in this case they set up people and, and the way people work, uh, they're essentially determining that the, the, the product or the architecture of the product and the people in the organizations or teams we have in place follow each other. They're symbiotic. And so one follows the other. And the problem is that when we do this, those organizational communication complexities or the paths that we create in the, in the organization get manifested as the paths in the solution design. And the larger that the organization is, the more prevalent this is. And then the more rigid it gets because essentially the paths become um, essentially uh, trampled on or, or, or run through more frequently. And so you start to see this in organizations, and sometimes you say, well, an organization is fairly rigid. How do we change the organization? Because all of a sudden now we've got an entire architecture and all of our component solutions that rely on this organization. Um, it's one of the reasons why Waterfall has stuck so long in organizations is because Waterfall has boxes, and those boxes of, of design, development, um, coding, testing, et cetera, fit our functional organizations. When we have a process, that matches an organizational structure. To change one or the other is very difficult because they rely on each other. And that's exactly what we see in these organizations. We see some, some interrelatedness that essentially larger organizations and the products and applications they support are symbiotic. And so to change one impacts the other and vice versa. So it's a very difficult thing to do. And, but the key here, is the key is to essentially create organizational flexibility that allows us to become more agile, allows us to build uh, more effective solutions for, for clients and actually drive more effective programs. And we'll talk a little bit more about how do we create flexible organizations. Not easy, but uh, essentially a key, a key element. So uh, where, does that, where does that leave us? I want, I want to provide just a, a bit of context about, I'm talking agile project management, but I'm going to talk a little bit about Scrum. I just want to make sure everybody understands when I say Agile and when I say Scrum that what I'm talking about. In general, if we look at this picture, Lean and Agile provide a framework of principles that, uh, that we use as guidelines. Uh, they aren't necessarily something you can implement. It would be like a pattern. Uh, Scrum, on the other hand, uh, essentially has a set of practices and is a framework that implements many of the Lean and Agile principles. And it's actually a a, the most well, I'm sorry, the, the most prevalent uh, process used today, probably by about a three quarters of the of the agile uh, teams and organizations are following Scrum. And XP is 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 a development practice that's often used by Scrum teams uh, to to do some specific um, specific practices for development and test. 
I'm going to talk a little bit about Scrum. My, uh, one of my roles is a, a certified Scrum coach and certified Scrum trainer, and so I work with organizations on Scrum quite a bit. So I use Scrum as, as my language, uh, but just to recognize that Scrum is just one implementation tool for a lean and agile uh, organization. So fundamentally, why was Scrum created? Well, if you go back to the original papers in 1986 of where Scrum was originally uh, founded, Scrum was written about originally as rugby. Uh, in the 1986 paper, Takeuchi and, and Minoko uh, wrote about essentially research and development going on in the automobile industry and saying uh, essentially a relay race approach where we hand off a baton from one department to the next is not as effective and does not meet the competitive market needs um, as well as a rugby approach where the entire team goes the distance to solve the problem. And so that paper, along with the work Ken Schwaber, Jeff Shuttle, and others were doing at the time, coincided. And they said, what we're doing is a team-based approach. And fundamentally, teams solve problems better than individuals. And not only that, but the way we solve them incrementally in short time boxes gives us the feedback loop required to essentially understand the complexities and get the feedback properly to, to solve these problems. And so those two elements, the team and the time box, become critical when it comes to Agile in general, but they also become critical when it comes to Agile program management. And I want to talk a little bit more about this and what does that mean. And so we talked about focus, communication, and transparency early on as being one of the three of the major issues we see in larger organizations. And I want to talk about this concept of team and time box and how we can use those to essentially bring back these three elements, even in large organizations. Busy slide here, but one primary element of, of what I'm trying to say. Most organizations that I go into, uh, either coming in as, hey, Pete, uh, we'd like an assessment of kind of how we're doing and Agile, we think we're Agile. Hey, Pete, we're not Agile, we're, th we're thinking about going Agile. Uh, can, you, can you come in and, and talk to us about you know, kind of what you're seeing? And for the most part, what they ask for is to look at what they're doing, to look at their practices. What they often misunderstand is that the way their teams are structured, the way their organization is aligned or not aligned, often is a bigger problem. And one of the problems that I see going on in organizations is this concept of team, or maybe I should say the lack of context of team, where essentially what, what you're seeing is they have teams, and every organization has teams, and the danger of saying, well, no, in Scrum we have teams, is you don't get it. A team, you know, in, a, in most organizations is what I see here, where, yes, we have this loosely defined coupling of people that are working together, and this is an ideal nature. Maybe you're not going to have every one of these types of people on your teams. Uh, but in general, you might have some of these some of these people. You might have multiple of uh, developers or, or whatnot on the team. But what I'm seeing is the fact that people on teams get directions from multiple places, both from a best practice perspective and from a work product perspective. When I say that best practice, what I'm saying is developers will get best practice direction from managers and, and architects saying, hey, we have coding standards to follow. We have a certain way to, um, to write unit tests. Uh, you know, check in, you know, all these different ways that we actually do our work. But then they're also pulled off for special projects. Developers might get pulled out because we have this new uh, client who's asking for something and we want to test out this new technology to see if we can actually get this new client on board. Uh, testers will get pulled out to say, hey, we've got this regression. We have, we have a problem. We need to go uh, regress this product, uh, this application. Uh, we need to get all the testers on board to go back and do that. Um, technical writers might be pulled to do a special project for uh, a new website that's coming in. We need a bunch of new content developed, and so I need you for this. And so what happens is all these special work product requests come in through the team with many different directions. And this team now has a very difficult time being predictable, high performing, or, or really understanding how to get its work done. And the majority of the problem, I, they say, is Pete, Scrum doesn't work. We, we can't predict our sprints. And we start to look at this element of team, and we start to understand, well, of course, your team's not focused. 
Another element that comes into play here, yet another busy screen, but to, to provide one, one major point, people are not on one team. In most organizations that I go into, people are on many teams. The average is probably about three. Um, some people being more than that, and certainly some roles like architects, um, uh, some, some uh, product people, some technical writers, uh, are, are stressed positions where they might be on six, seven, eight teams or products that they're supporting. Uh, developers usually a little bit better. They might be one or two, uh, sometimes three. Testers usually go across many teams. And so um, one of the major problems is we're seeing that, that we have people that are spread across the organization working on various projects that are starting, stopping in various stages of the organization. And so what we look at from a, a, both a team perspective and a program perspective is we say, if we can change two things here. One is we have the concept of team. And that concept of team changes from what we talked about before in that, number one, we have dedicated individuals to a team. And that, number two, direction for that team comes only in two ways. For work products, and, and what we're doing when I say work products, I'm saying, applications, products, you know, bugs, you know, all the things we got to do to get value to our customers or clients or, or, or our business, that comes through one single pipeline. And the best practices come through another pipeline. Those can come essentially through our managers or through a best practice center or a center of excellence or whatever it is you might have inside your organization. But we explicitly distinguish the two. And the the Scrum Master then plays a key role in making sure that that work is actually coming through one pipeline, coming through a product owner that's making decisions on behalf of many stakeholders. Right? There, there's certainly still many stakeholders. There's sales, there's, there's support, there's business people, et cetera, uh, you know, market, market needs, et cetera, that are coming in. But it needs to be prioritized into a team. And what this is saying is that everything goes to a team. There's no concept in, inside an organization anymore where we pull people out for special projects. If there's a special project, we funnel it through work products into a team. Or we, or we form another team for some period, but what we, what we avoid at all possible is we start to avoid this concept of overlapping teams, uh, team members coming in and out um, across the organization. And it seems simple. It seems idealistic, and some, some most people would say, well, it's a little bit too simplistic and idealistic. It is and it isn't. It is in the standpoint that it's, there's always going to be some people that have to go across teams. We understand that. But it isn't in the fact that when we start to do this, when you start to see the, the, the productivity gains and the high, you know, when you hear Jeff Sullivan talk about hyper-productive teams, you're starting to understand that this is what he's talking about. If you, if you take, for, for example, just take another analogy of, of like sports, and, and you know, going back to something like this scenario and talking about multiple scrum teams, you'd be taking somebody like Peyton Manning from the Colts and saying, OK, not only are you on the Colts, but you're on the Bears and you're on the Broncos. And you know, on Sunday, you've got to play three games. Well, there's no way that Peyton Manning could be effective in three games in the same weekend, right, or even on the same day. But that's exactly what we're asking most of our teams to do or team members to do inside organizations. And so oftentimes we'd say, well, sports is a great analogy for you know, showing high-performing teams, but they have everything set up to be successful. They have dedicated, um, dedicated teams. They have one singular goal. They have one you know, very specific role. They have a coach. Right? They're, they're set up in such a way that, sorry, went backwards. They went, they're set up in such a way that, that they have exactly this. And all I'm saying is we can create that in organizations just like we create them in sports, which gives us the ability to now take that and scale it. Let me go on to communication. So that was focus. Second piece is communication. Now what we're looking at here, uh, I have overlaid on the right that chart again where we see the communication, the roles and responsibilities going on inside an organization and the communication paths. Okay. That gets charted out. And this is a chart that charts on the, the x-axis on the bottom uh, the number of roles in the organization. And what you'll see is the chart on the right 
uh, is circled as a dot there between 40 and 60. Okay, and that dot is basically 49. And so in this company, which, by the way, astounded me when we did this organization because they hardly have about, uh, you know, 100 people or so inside the, the well, there's more in support and otherwise, but inside the R&D and stuff, uh, they're hardly twice the number of roles they have defined. And they defined a number of roles in their communication structures. And what you see there is their, their number of roles is 49. And then on the y-axis, what you're seeing is their communication saturation, which means what percentage of communication of the total are they actually achieving, okay? Meaning that if all of those roles could communicate with every other role, right, that would be 100%. And what this is saying is they're at about, I think it was 13%, okay? Meaning that only 13% of the roles, and that would be like an architect or a developer or a senior developer or a senior architect or, you know, a content manager, you know, a role talking to another role. They're only talking about 13%. And obviously, the more roles you have in an organization, the fewer communication that's possible because it just takes too much. And you, you look at that chart and you say, wow, there's a lot of communication going on there. And you're right. There is a lot of communication. It's actually a fairly strong team the time we, we took this um, took this snapshot of the team. They're, they're a strong, highly communicative team. But given the number of roles, they had, they had a number of issues that essentially prevented them from growing very effectively. And so one of the things they were struggling with is growing even larger. And what you'll see in this chart is if we could reduce the number of roles, the number of specialties inside of organization, you know, when you talk about you know, having database administrator, well, senior database administrator, database administrator associate, you know, those types of things. When we can talk about reducing the number of roles, we can talk about increasing the communication inside your organization. And that's one of the things we look for in creating a more flexible organization. A second chart here on communication talks about essentially looking at the same organization here. Now they're circled. What you're seeing is uh, they're circled up at the top there. And again, they've got about 49 roles. So now roles is on the y-axis. And communication intensity ratio is on the x-axis. Let me just explain what that means for just a minute. Communication intensity ratio basically says that what is the busiest roles communication to the average roles communication. And so the dot way off on the right there is after six would indicate that that organization, the busiest role is almost seven times busier than the average, meaning they have some role that is just in the middle of everything, you know, superhero role. Okay, most organizations fall around three to four, meaning that some roles are about four times busier than other roles. Okay, what we find though is if we can move that down, meaning that you can even out the work inside your organization, which means that we're distributing more of the responsibility to the teams, to the actual producers, developers, testers, uh, content writers, etc that when we can start to share that, get it down to two or below, meaning that the busiest person is only twice as busy as the average, then we're creating increased communication inside organizations. Now, much of this work that I've been describing on communication comes from work Neil Harrison did uh, in his, uh, in the, uh, he's got papers written on patterns of effective organizations. There's also a book written on agile organizational patterns. Um, the, the pictures you're seeing here are a, uh, a complement of both some of their early work they did as well as then I brought on Neil and some of my clients. We've actually taken some of these pictures uh, with Neil. So we've coordinated on some of this uh, for organizations to actually provide them some of, these, uh, some of these charts about what's going on inside the organizations. And so when you start to see these pictures, it's kind of like a mirror and starting to look, look at, okay, how is our organization actually talking together? How are we actually communicating? What's the effectiveness of these communications? Now, there's a lot more to this I'm not going to go into right now. Um, the third one I'm, I'll, just talk, I'll just touch on is we, we actually look at which roles actually become critical. And what we're looking at is actually getting producer roles more critical than manager roles. And oftentimes in organizations, certainly this one proved out, managers played the heaviest uh, communication paths, which is usually problematic for companies. And one of the things we see with agile program management and program management in general, program managers tend to be incredibly busy. 
And the reason they're incredibly busy is because we've set up organizations to have so many dependencies and so many communication paths that they have no other choice. So when we start to change some of those dynamics, the program management role starts to simplify. The third element uh, is transparency. And a very simple picture here, maybe, um, uh, that one of the, the, probably the third piece that I, that I fail to see in organizations when we go into them is the concept of uh, two-level planning or, or a higher-level planning. And what I mean by that is, is most organizations I go into understand the iterative cycle, understand sprints. And when I say understand, I mean they do them. They don't necessarily do them well or right. That's another issue. But they do them. They plan them. They develop. They do daily scrums. And they, they meet at the end. And they talk about the product. Sometimes they talk about the process and fix it. Sometimes they don't. But in general, they do the bottom right sprint cycle, the blue sprint cycle down there. What I don't see in organizations, and key to agile program management, is essentially the release cycle or the product cycle. You could call it a project cycle, program cycle, whatever you want to call it. I, I use the term release quite often just because um, uh, that's more of a generic term. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean after each one of these cycles you have to release. Releases could happen incrementally at different times. That's OK. What I'm talking about here, though, is the fact that as a program and as teams within that program, we have a visioning cycle meaning that we actually create the vision, we actually create release and scope boundaries, we actually do some what's called release planning, which actually articulates in quarterly milestones what it is we're trying to produce. And that, that, that fact that we do that essentially drives effective uh, sprint cycles by nature of it. The other piece that we tie into here then is a regular Review. So this is a cycle. It's not a one-time thing. If I go back and I look at that, these are actually two wheels that are turning. Every time the blue wheel turns, every time our sprint cycle goes around, we have a, a quick update on the yellow cycle. Okay, there's a, big, there's a big turn on the yellow cycle at the beginning every quarter. But at, after every sprint, we actually have another quick turn of that yellow cycle, and that's represented here. So what you're seeing on this, on this slide is essentially a bunch of arcs. Okay, each one of those arcs represents teams and their sprint cycles. Okay, so I've got some that are very short little arcs. Okay, those might represent one week sprints. So you got some teams that are going along very rapidly. Maybe they have a very simple product. They're in a maintenance mode. They can they can go very quickly. Uh, then you've got other teams in there, maybe on a two week sprint cycle. Okay, so you know maybe they're they're going um, on what's probably the most prevalent sprint cycle. Two weeks is, is relevant. And maybe you've got some teams on a one-month sprint cycle. That's OK. Um, but what this is saying is two things. Well, three things, really. Number one, we've defined as a program what it is we're trying to do. And we've done it in a quarterly basis, meaning that we've got a quarterly roadmap as well as we've got a quarterly release plan. And that release plan actually identifies everything we're trying to accomplish in stories and points we actually track that through release burn down, um, the goals of, of, of each team. And that once we actually start executing, every month we have what's called a shared sprint review, meaning that every team comes together and presents their work to a large audience of stakeholders. Okay? And this is essentially the short circuit for most of the meetings that go on in typical program management style. What I see in most organizations um, and I, um, is you know, we have project status meetings. We have program status meetings. And oftentimes those meetings are team leaders come together around a table. We sit and we have a status report. And the status report talks about percentage complete and risks and, and dependencies and, and things like that. And, and people are glazed over and, and everybody's happy and goes back. And it feels very Dilbert-esque. What this is is very different. Okay? This is a two-phased piece that in the in interim within the month, we might have sprint, we would have sprint reviews, but they're normal sprint reviews. You've got one or two stakeholders involved. Every month, you have a, a large sprint review where multiple teams in the program come and present. And not only are they presenting, they're actually demonstrating like you would see in an agile sprint review. So they demonstrate. They, they basically provide their, their um, um, uh, release up, 
update, which which is represented in a, a uh, parking lot report. Um, forgot to I didn't didn't put that in the slide deck, um, but uh, essentially provide just a, a basic overview, one or two slides on how the team did, uh, what they accomplished in the last sprint, and 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 their their progress to the release to date, and then they actually demonstrate some of the features. So there's actually uh, real feedback coming directly from the stakeholders. Now this would happen. Um, so just to give you an example, um, um, I've got uh, uh, Salesforce who does this. They do this in, in two days. They, they take half their teams in, in the platform program and do this in one day. Half the team in the application platform do it another day. Uh, it doesn't take the full day. It might be a, a half or three-quarter day. And each team gets somewhere between 15 to 25 minutes. And that's enough to introduce what they're doing uh, and, and to talk about the, the issues. And, the key here is really the fact that um, you're starting to short circuit and you're starting to see patterns across the program. If, if teams are not getting certain items done, uh, we start to see why. Well, our person got pulled off to do this, and that's why we didn't get this item done in our, our sprint. Um, uh, we, had, um, uh, we ran into a number of customer support issues. Maybe that's coming across, so you identify some quality issues. So there's, there's a number of things that you start to see, both program patterns and, and architectural patterns, but you also see organizational impediment patterns uh, when you start to short circuit and start to have teams directly involved with stakeholders. So I started to talk about Salesforce as one. They're right in the middle there. I uh, just wanted to, to highlight some companies and, and to talk about some of the different um, ways that this manifests itself in various sized organizations that I've been involved with. And certainly, this is something that's done in other organizations I'm, I'm not involved, but, but we'll talk to the ones that obviously I'm more familiar with. Um, JDA Software at the top there um, uh, has gone through a, a number of different uh, uh, inclinations or, or instantiations because of the fact that they've grown so much. They've, they've actually accumulated other companies. Uh, right now, they have uh, over 500 people in their R&D department. Uh, implementing an Agile process. They're right now actually uh, going through kind of a third phase. They went through an initial phase of, of a lot of the things we've been talking about here with team alignment, uh, focus, um, uh, reducing a number of the roles and, and solidifying the, the funnel of where product management comes in. Their second, their second phase really went through an, um, an offshoring element and making that effective. They're actually right now in the process of going through a third phase of virtualization, actually uh, creating a virtual Agile environment. So they're actually on kind of phase three of their Agile instantiation. Uh, Corporate Express is a good example of, of a large IT organization, and certainly not you know, large from the concept of, you know, I know there are organizations out there with thousands of people, but large that, that have a lot of the, the common problems you find in IT organizations with, with respect to the functional and component-based alignment of teams. And so, for example, Corporate Express has an 18-member database group. Okay, these DBAs controlled all changes of the database. All right, so when we set up organizations for Scrum and Agile, we said, okay, you know, we've got to, we've got to have some quick turnaround here, and yet the organization was set up in such a way that, that essentially they had barriers in place that were unable to make changes appropriate. And so we had to begin realigning the organization in such a way to allow these programs to be successful, and so we had to start bringing database uh, database people onto the teams to create cross-functional teams that are focused. And by golly, the database people liked it. You know, there, there was a lot of concern about you know what you know losing some of their some of their best practices and things like that. Obviously, they have a lot of governance in place on on making sure that that the scalability and, and reliability, redundancy, et cetera, of their databases is intact. Uh, but that's based on the conversations we've had already. Still comes through a database organization. It's just a much smaller database or a core database organization with distributed members on on uh, application teams that can actually develop solutions for clients. Um, there's other ones in here. Um, uh, wireless generation, Grable, or other instances of both R&D organizations and IT organizations that have uh, gone through this process. Um, uh, wireless generation is rather new in the last year. Grable has been doing this for about uh, four or five years. Um, they, were, they were very interesting in the fact that unlike some of the pictures we saw of the very busy with many roles, uh, Grable is an organization with very few roles. So you'd think, okay, they could be agile very quickly. But yet, 
even though they had very few roles, they still had very little communication going on. And some of the reason for that is they were so siloed. A lot of their individual members weren't really in a team environment, not communicating. And that led to very similar problems with, with predictability, quality, um, and, and transparency. And so bringing those into a team environment uh, created a much better uh, portfolio program view for them. So in summary, kind of uh, what have we talked about here? Um, essentially, there's three key elements that I'm, that I'm uh, trying to highlight. Uh, the focus, which says we need to solidify and focus our teams, meaning that we need to essentially create stable, more stable teams and funnel projects and work items to the team through a singular product owner that can make decisions on behalf of that team and make prioritization uh, level, level decisions and limit our work to the available teams we have or create new cross-functional teams to support the new work, uh, rather than trying to say, okay, how can we jam you know, 10 pounds into a 5-pound bag, figuring out how we can actually work, you know, lower our working process and, and move it through more quickly, uh, a, lean, a lean manufacturing technique um, to, to the available teams. The second is communication. If we reduce the number of roles inside of organizations and we begin to share work across those roles more evenly, which basically means we start to change the responsibilities of the members of, of different teams, what we're, what we're doing essentially is we're increasing the communication, which by increasing the communication, we're decreasing the likelihood of uh, unknown risks. We're, we're in, increasing the um, understanding and work out of dependencies and some of the other key elements that we, that we deal with in program management. And, and finally, in transparency, when we can actually bring people into a, a quarterly release cycle with monthly sprint reviews, we avoid a lot of wasted time in meetings, number one. And number two, we essentially start to understand the program patterns that are critical to understanding uh, you know, some of the key dependencies, risks, um, and getting the predictability we need uh, to, to make sure that stakeholders are, are kept, kept in the loop. So as, as kind of a, an overall uh, overarching summary, um, I see Agile Project Management as taking the high-performing team environment that we find in kind of that startup world where you have a single team product and scaling it to a large organization uh, or product portfolio without losing your productivity, predictability, or quality. And that, to me, is the challenge taking this hyper-performing teams and scaling it up so you can have many of these teams working in a coordinated way. And the only way I've been able to see effectively do this is through some of the techniques that, that um, uh, we've talked about here. And hopefully you've seen some of that as well. Uh, and I'll just leave it at that. We're at 9.45. So we'll uh, open it up for questions. Thank you so much, Pete. We do have several questions, and again, I encourage you all to um, answer the, or ask those. Um, so the first one is, when you're looking at these best practices, where do you start, um, from the top down or the bottom up? I would, I would prefer to answer the questions rather than ask them. But, um, <laughs> so top down or bottom up, um, good question. And um, it, can, it can happen both, and it does, and it's best if it goes both ways. Okay, so you will probably fail if it's completely top down, and you're going to fail if it's completely bottom up. Uh, meaning that if it's completely top down, what you're going to find is that you're going to get a lot of rejection and pushback because it's change. And any time you make a change in an organization, especially changing roles, responsibilities, who I report to, what I do for a day, you know, day to day, those are big changes. Okay, so we don't take them lightly. But when it comes top down, it, it's it's there's always pushback, there's always reticence, and it's usually under the covers. And you don't see it, and it turns out to be high turnover, turns out to be you know, lower productivity, lower quality, because people are just disgruntled but unwilling to share, usually. When it comes bottom up, um, it, it struggles for a long time, and it takes a long time. It can be possible, and there are companies that have done it that way. Uh, and, and Corporate Express would be one of those that kind of come bottom up. Um, and it's taken a long time, and now it's Corporate Express actually, if you don't know, has been bought by Staples. Um, so now they're a Staples company. And they've got increased challenges now with bottom-up because the, the up just got further up. And so while they were having a lot of success as Corporate, Corporate Express, now that they're part of Staples are in, in more, of a, uh, more of a challenge continuing to try to work up that stream. Uh, 
you know, the couple of examples that I find that worked really successfully, uh, just to highlight, um, number one, JDA. JDA came uh, both top down and bottom up. What they did was essentially top down. They said, you know, we need a change. We obviously have a problem. But what they did is they created a bottom up task force, and Salesforce did this too. They created a bottom up task force to determine what to do. And that task force came up with, okay, let's go agile, let's do this. And they worked together. And then they were able to both um, both leverage top-down decision making and changes that need to be made because you know I'm talking about program management I'm talking about not just project management you know extended what I'm talking about is core changes to the organization to make program management more effective and most program managers come from the project management world and don't have the capability to make these changes so it does require obviously to be effective at scale leadership decision making so Okay, the next question is, with a focused team, the best, best, practice, best practices can still come from various functional organizations, uh, for example, dev or QA, which can lead to conflict within the team. How do you deal with that? Repeat the first part of that. With a focused team, the best practices can still come from various functional organizations? Yes. Yes. So, so for something like this, so you're right. Um, um, let me give you two examples. Um, and I'll, I'll use, I'll use um, JDA and Salesforce again because they're, they're two competing examples of functional organization or structural organizations. JDA, from the outset, reorganized their teams into what's called a project matrix organization. And the project matrix organization essentially says, I as a developer actually now report into a business line. I no longer report into you know, the VP of development. Okay, and I as tester also report into that business line and no longer report into the VP of QA. So, so what they actually did is they actually created their teams and their reporting structure very similarly, which reinforced essentially the team constructs. Salesforce, on the other hand, said, we're going to create these teams, we're going to create these funnels and do just what's on your page here. But we're going to leave the functional matrix in place, which means the developers still report to development managers, testers still report to test managers, product owners still report to product management. But they, they took this very seriously, and they said engineering directors and engineering managers only drive best practices, okay? And the work that teams work on uh, come through the product owner pipeline, and if we, if we need to get developer work on something, it has to be prioritized with the rest of the work. Now, they also do a few other things. Um, they do allow some things like sabbaticals from teams, meaning that I, as a developer, could actually take time off of a team to do some special uh, um, development growth initiatives, uh, or I, as a tech writer, could go off and, and learn some new technology. Um, and so you're, they, they provide that. They also um, uh, provide uh, uh, the, um, the, the leaders who were quality directors or, or engineering directors to take other roles that, you know, if they feel like I used to drive product and now I'm not doing that because it is a change and it primarily changes that first tier management structure. They gave them some of the options to become scrum masters or architects or product owners depending on where they would like to you know, pursue their interests. Because some, not everybody is a good best practice leader and just HR type leader. And so they, they allowed people to move within the organization to you know, fit their, their, their skill set. So it can, work, it can work with both, but it's harder with a functional matrix just because you've got to be more intent on the teams. It's a little bit easier and it's been documented um, uh, in a new product development book um, I could put out later, I forgot the name of it, um, that project matrix teams where the, the hard line is in the business unit are actually more agile and more productive than functional matrix teams. All right, the next question we have is, how do distributed teams impact the scaling model? Is it a deal breaker and do you have techniques to deal with it? Yeah, I didn't, uh, didn't address distribution, obviously, here in this talk. Um, it's not a deal breaker. Uh, as I mentioned, JDA uh, is very distributed, uh, going back to here. Um, the other teams you see, the other organizations you see there are mostly co-located. Obviously, well, maybe I shouldn't say that. Studies have shown 
co-located teams are more productive than distributed teams. Okay? It's not a deal breaker, but it's, it's a recognized cost impact. Um, JDA is a, is a, is a uh, distributed team. They have actually over 500 people alone in India working on development. Uh, they, have about, they have less than 100 uh, in the US uh, working on their R&D team uh, where they do a lot of coordination. The, it, it requires additional tooling. Uh, so, you know, having, uh, and I know uh, JDA is actually a client of, of version one, that they're one of the early clients of version one. Uh, they use version one very heavily for, for helping them communicate. Uh, so tooling is, is a critical element to that. Uh, second, um, if you can uh, essentially have some co-location, and JDA does this, where they have a majority of the development team and testers together, uh, where the communication line, because it's so limited between US and especially West Coast US and, and India, um, you only have an hour or two every day to actually provide that high power communication, high bandwidth communication. To have a majority of communication going on in one locale is helpful. But there's been other studies uh, where Jeff Sutherland's done some good work on highly distributed teams that, that are very effective. Um, you know, there's some smaller organizations that, that can do this, but the larger programs, um, uh, you know, require, require a, bit more, um, a bit more tooling. Um, and if you can keep individual teams, even if the program's distributed, and I'm working on a number of different programs for some cell phone companies and, and otherwise where the entire program is distributed. Uh, what we do, though, is, is project teams are, are, for the most part, co-located uh, that are working in the program. And so the program has um, uh, some communication challenges, but the project teams themselves have a be little bit better communication channel. OK, next question is, when you are scaling your agile practices, how important is it to get outside consulting help? Uh, I guess I have a conflict of interest on that one. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I would I would say that just kind of honestly, there's a lot of there's a lot of companies that that try to do Scrum or Agile and and fail. And the reason they're failing is they're really a couple of a couple of things. One is they don't understand the depth of it, meaning that they look at the surface elements, they look at the practices, and they just apply the practices at an at a, at a, at a introductory level. And when they don't work, they don't have enough knowledge, experience, or otherwise to address appropriately. And so the changes that they end up making uh, actually end up hurting. And so uh, and these changes are are very are very difficult. And so, just just for example, just thinking about team, you know, you read team in a book and you just gloss over it because we've read team for you know many many years, and so we just understand what team means. But until you really understand what Scrum means by team, and you start to get into this concept of the importance of it, until you actually experience when you actually do a team, and everybody typically has one of those experiences. It's like the light bulb. Of, yeah, I was on a team once where you know, man, were we good? And you know, you ask, well, what was involved with it, right? And what happened it was really small. We were focused. We had a goal. We you know, we were driven. You know, we were all in the same room, kind of stuff. It's all that you know, agile type stuff that comes out. But then you say, we got to create that for every team we have. Oh no, 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 we can't do that. You know, we got X, Y, Z. So, so what ends up happening is we, we take for granted what is because we can't change it. And when we can't change it, that's when Scrum starts to fail. Because Scrum's going to point out all the problems for you. It's going to tell you right in your face what's wrong. But most companies are unable to make the changes required. And, and often, oftentimes an outside consultant, for whatever reason, we, we come with more, more trust sometimes and, and given more leeway. But can, can maybe get an organization over that hump to try some things they would otherwise be unable to, to try or get leadership to get on board where they would otherwise be unable to. So that's where a consultant can really help. Bring ideas from other companies like these on the, on the list here uh, and then help sway some of those leadership uh, decisions. 
Okay, uh, I think this will probably be our final question, but how are you defining program management by organization, customer, or product vision? Uh, good question. I defined program management, um, I'm going to zoom all the way up to the top. Um, I, de I define program management very simply uh, in that to me it's, it's a shared um, goal. Right, that, that is going to require more than one team to implement. And that shared goal might be you know, a new service or a, a, a new um, business or you know, something, uh, but it has multiple elements to it. Uh, so it's different from a project in that a project typically has one output or you know, a, a couple of outputs, but a program more has a, a solution or a result uh, to it that will have multiple outputs. And those multiple outputs might be multiple products, might be multiple applications, might be multiple services, et cetera, you're trying to accomplish. And the program management aspect is less worried about each individual one. It's more worried about the, the collective whole. Uh, and so to me, it's, it's um, and why I focused my talk where I did was oftentimes we focus too much on the products and the process. And that to me, program management is too dependent on organization to ignore, and I think we're seeing too much of it ignored today. Uh, and so that's why I wanted to kind of push this out there and say, hey, you might have a whole element here that you're missing in program management that you might want to take a look at. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Pete, and an excellent presentation. Um, thank you all for attending today, and um, please be sure to join us for our next week's um, webinar and hope to see you all there. Thank you. Thank you.